Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome to the second lecture. <clears throat> Do you have any queries on what we have done till now? We are still into introduction, but if you have any questions, you should ask. Okay. So I will ask very briefly, what is structural analysis? No, do not read. You are all going to be teachers or practitioners. It's a simple question. What's your name? Like that you should answer. <laughs> Seriously, what is structural analysis? It's the application of solid mechanics to, to finding the response of a given structure when it is subject to a given loading. Then we said we look at the meaning of structure. So uh, we ended the last class with this slide. Okay. So, if typically any structure is made up of elements and uh, in this course we are primarily focusing on the skeletal elements uh, and uh, we went through this, there are also spatial elements. The most complex of these are the space frame element and all others are special cases of this. This has got six uh, force resultants. Now, in the beginning we said that the whole idea of uh, doing structural analysis is because it is part of structural design. And uh, we want to make sure that um, any structure, either a proposed structure or an existing structure which you are investigating must be adequately uh, strong, stiff, first stable and the other two are add-ons, it should uh, be economical and aesthetic. So when you do design, you have to look into stresses. But when we do structural analysis, we do not go to the level of stresses. We work with the resultants. So we talk of internal forces. We talk of bending moments, shear forces, twisting moments, <coughs> actual forces. So what you see here is, uh, you can combine all this and make it into a vector. You have a force vector and you have a moment vector. The force vector that you have will point in some direction. It will have a component in the axial direction and that is called an axial force. Could be tensile, could be compressive. You have two components. Uh, well, for convenience, let me take the orthogonal directions, vertical and horizontal. Those are the two shear forces possible. You have a moment vector which you can resolve in three directions. The one which is pointing in the actual direction is your twisting moment, right? And the other two components are your bending moments. So you have a biaxial bending. So this is as complicated as it can get. But uh, we try to simplify and then we go to, uh, we go to planar structures. A planar structure is a structure in which all the elements lie in one plane and the loads are acting also in the same plane. That is very important. And uh, we looked into this in the last class. Now, all these elements are connected by joints and it is very important to understand a joint. Okay? So, what is a joint? What is the purpose of a joint? Simple question. Any joint, elbow joint. What is a, there are two functions a joint does. What, what is that? Yeah. It transfers force. Transfer is uh, not the best word though it is very commonly used. Force transfer we say. Why is transfer not as good a word as transmit? I transfer some money to your bank account from my bank account. But then I do not have that money with me anymore. It is all yours. 
but if I transmit, I still have it. So that's a much more, that's what happens, forces are transmitted, though commonly we say also transfer. So there is a, a static function, a force related function of transmitting some force, force is a generic word, it also includes a moment, across a joint. So you have two members, something is being transmitted across a joint from one member to the other member. It's a force transmission, that's a static function. There's one more function. In fact, this is possible only because of the other function. What is that? Into structure integrated. It makes a structure integrated. You're right. Otherwise, it will all fall apart. So you need to attain integrity in a structure. How do you achieve that? So keep looking at it from this point of view. The whole of structural analysis is all about two fields. One is called a force field, a field of all possible forces. The other is called a displacement field, a field of all displacements. Are you getting it? So when we said to find the response, we are talking of force response and displacement response, right? Uh, they are connected and that's where I told you displacement is something that you see. Hmm? Whereas force is something that you imagine. Hmm? Force is, comes from mass times acceleration. Acceleration is not easy to visualize. Okay, whereas displacement are very easy to see. Something moves. Um, so we have a function called a kinematic function. And you know, we are all biased to forces. Why? That's how we were taught. We were all taught, we were taught equilibrium first. The strains came later, the displacement, but displacements are equally important. So you have to, that's why I said the right brain looks at displacements, the left brain analyzes forces. Got it? Okay. So the first function is, it's related to what you said, to maintain integrity in the structure. For that, you have to have a, a kinematic function. So you want to ensure, for example, this joint, I want this joint to ensure that when it moves, it drags along this member and this member in any direction. So if this joint moves here, it drags along with it this member and this member so that there is no relative translation in any plane between the two members. Otherwise, there is a separation that maintains the integrity of the structure. At the same time, I want to allow some movements. So I want some restriction and some of So, for example, I want to allow this rotation. So, there's a change in the angle. This is called a hinged joint. Sometimes I want to allow movements in multiple dimensions, right? Like a ball and socket joint. So, that's it. You've got rotations, you've got translation. You want to allow some, you want to restrict some. The choice is yours. And it is because you restrict you prevent relative translation that you provide for a force transmission. Are you getting it? The transmission is an effect. The cause is, so this is primary. The kinematic function is the cause. The static function which you desire is an effect. Got it? So we talk of, uh, these are ideal joints. We talk of a pinned joint. Hmm? Slowly as we grow old, I get a bit of arthritis and all that. Then I can't move it so easily. Got it? Uh, but still I can move with great difference. If I, I can't move at all, if there's no relative motion possible at all, it's called a rigid joint. And somewhere in between, we call a semi-rigid joint. Are you getting it? That's it. These are the ideal condition. And you can apply this both to translation and to rotation. Okay? Rotation can be a flexural kind of rotation or it could be an angle of twist. All right, so we got these are joints. Now, if I arbitrarily pick some point here, I can even say this is also a joint because I can imagine this member here and this member there with a joint. What is that joint? That's a rigid joint. It's, you understand? 
it's like if I had two members and I had welded that joint, after the, and the weld is done so well that I can't see the weld, that's how you make long members, right? You connect them. Uh, then it's as good as a rigid joint, which means, so uh, members are actually made up of small elements rigidly connected to one another. And what does it do? It makes sure that the members on both sides move exactly the same together at the same time without separation. Hmm? That function, that is called compatibility. You are making both sides compatible. They don't separate out. And sometimes you want a little movement, relative movement. And when you do that, you are, let's say you, you make this an internal hinge. You allow this elbow kind of movement. It's precisely because you allow this movement, you are preventing a transmission of bending moment from this to this or this to this. So there's a beautiful link. You arrest something, you allow something. You allow something, you arrest some transmission. And uh, that's the beauty of this subject. You have to, it should come alive. And uh, you should see it both with your left brain and your right brain and everything clicks beautifully. Now we'll talk of supports, which are also joints. So we, we normally give supports at the extremities, right? This is called a fixed support, which means basically between the support and this, no relative movement, no relative translation, no relative rotation. Got it? At a support, you have to, of course, you can have support movements also, but typically supports don't move. Now, this is called a hinge support, you know, a knife edge fixed to a base. This is called a roller support, uh, where you uh, allow some horizontal movement. And um, because you arrest this movement in this direction, because there's a floor there, you can develop a reaction. Look at this. Because you arrest, you are, you're getting a reaction. If I give you freedom, Mm -hmm. you won't give any reaction. But if I lock you up in your room, after three days you'll be banging the door, is it not? Because you feel you're arrested. It's always like that. It's a law of nature. But if I keep the doors open and all that, you won't bang the door, hopefully. So this, uh, because you're allowing it to roll like this, you won't develop a horizontal reaction. Here you have arrested this movement and this movement. And we put an arrow which can act either up or down or left or right because the directions can change depending on, on, uh, on uh, what kind of forces are, are acting. Here, you, can, you are arresting the vertical movement, so you get a vertical reaction. You are arresting the horizontal movement, you get a horizontal reaction. You are arresting the rotation. Which rotation? The relative rotation between the wall or the fixed uh, support and this element. Got it? Very simple. So you got a good idea of both the functions, the kinematic function and the static function. Now this is sometimes referred to as what? Can you tell me? It's an intermediate support. Usually supports are at the ends. But this fellow is uh, in a way coming in between. And here you are enabling continuity of the member above the support. So across the joint you are ensuring that the left and right move exactly the same, but you're also saying that if this were to bend, then if I draw a tangent there, the left side and the right side will rotate exactly the same, the same theta, either clockwise or anticlockwise. When we do bending, we'll understand that. Okay, good. What is stability? When do you say a structure is stable? Now, remember, we began by saying uh, we are talking about systems. A structure is a system, structural system. You have a political system. You have an economic system. So, in all the, you have a system of differential equation. In all these cases, stability has the same meaning. What is the meaning? Psychologically, so this guy is st stable. 
but not perhaps this guy. Under some conditions, he becomes unstable. Right? So, can you give me a lovely, common definition of stability? Because we should always work from the whole to the part. Then you'll, you'll love this subject even more. Yeah. What is stability? Let, uh, let's take a political system. What do you mean by no relative movement? I don't understand. Consistency. No politician is ever consistent. <laughs> you are again limiting your answer to a structure. You are not talking of a system. Right. Good. So, she uses words like perturbation. Perturbation is a small disturbance. Let's say you have a political system. You have the treasury benches and you have the opposition benches, right? Now, something happens and a few guys decide to walk over from one side to the other side. The whole government can collapse. And nobody wants a system like that. That's a potentially unstable system. Because the you don't have a, um, you don't have stability any time this uh, crossover can happen. But in a uh, deeper sense, you want to predict the response of any system when it's subject to some stimulus, more or less. So let's say a response parameter is say y. Yeah, you can sit here. Hello. You have a, a parameter uh, y, a, fun a variable y. Y is a function of say x1, x2, x3, x4. You can write any equation. I'm making it a functional uh, thing. So, let's say I've put some numbers to the x1, x2, x3, x4. x1 is 10.3, x2 is minus 5.4, whatever. I've got a value of y. Now, if I give a perturbation to any one of these x's or to all of them, let's say I change by 1%. These things happen in life. I, what kind of change do I expect in y? Similar magnitude, 1%, 2%. If I get a change of 100% in y, just because I change x slightly, that's a classic example of a system which gets into chaos, uh, which becomes unstable. Are you getting it? So normally, she is a stable person. But under some peculiar situations, when she is stressed and you trigger her with uh, some word which will um, make her unstable, it can happen to the best of us, by the way. So buckling is like that. Normally, everything looks fine. But once you reach close to the critical load and you, that's it, it completely changes its configuration. You get very large. Uh, displacements which are completely disproportionate to the stimulus. Are you getting it? So, all of us understand what stability is. Now, we want structures to be stable. That's the first thing we want. And since we uh, live in a terrestrial context on earth, uh, once upon a time when we were uh, primitives, Primates, uh, we used to live on top of trees and the trees would shake a lot. We could tolerate a lot of movement. But now we can't. So we won't, don't want our houses to move a lot. So we are into the realm of small deformations. It should be very small. It should remain like that. It should never uh, get into large movements because we feel psychologically uncomfortable. Is it clear? So. Stability is that. And supports are supposed to not move at all, ideally. Now, here we uh, talk of internal stability and external for convenience. So, always when you use words like internal and external, we have in mind some boundary. Right? So, is this object external to you or internal to you? This is internal to you. It's internal to the room, but to you, this is external, right? Because typically, we identify with the body. The skin forms your boundary. So, in our minds, we commonly accept some boundary. Of course, in philosophy, that boundary is entirely questioned. But this is not a class in philosophy. Uh, in, we are dealing with matter. So, let's stay with the common understanding. So, 
within the boundary of this structure. We have not yet put supports. Supports we'll add later. Supports give the structure external stability, but within the structure there shouldn't be movements. Now let's say I take four rods and I put hinges there, internal hinges. Is this internally stable? Which means no large movements should happen. This configuration should remain like a square. No, you can play with it, right? This is called, what is this called? This is called a mechanism. You know, children love to play with it. You can change, change the shape, any shape, because this hinge ensures that this angle need not be 90 degrees. It can be 10 degrees, 15, you name it, 150 degrees, you can play with it. Got it? Acute angle, obtuse angle, doesn't matter. So the whole thing is a mechanism. Now, we don't want structures to behave like that unless deliberately we want it that way. Normally, no. So we, we want to make it stable. How to make it stable? Just we are beginning with a simple example. How to make it stable? I want especially those students who are not necessarily in structural engineering to answer. Yeah? You have to arrest. You are right. Arresting is a secret. Hmm? How do you arrest? What to do? Practically? Huh? No, no. Uh, you can fix supports. We, we are not bringing supports. Internally, that play should not happen. A little movement is allowed, but not uh, massive changes in configuration. What to do? He says, we'll add one more member, okay, a diagonal, because that's what, if you, you can add one more member. Let's say there's no member to add, then, but I can give you a welding rod. You can weld. So we can convert the hinge joint to a rigid joint by welding. How many joints do you need to weld to make it just rigid, to make it internally stable? How many joints do you need to weld? You just, uh, two. So your right brain is not functioning well. Okay. <coughs> just weld one, let's say this corner, just weld it. I remove the internal hinge. In your mind you play with it. Can you move it? If you can move it, you must be able to draw it. So you, you must be good in drawing. Can you draw it? You'll find it doesn't work. So we have to do thought experiments, but for very uh, unimaginative students, we actually need to demonstrate with models and all that. And we are all good students from IIT, so I hope you can play with it in your mind. Can you play? You can understand what I'm saying. Right? At the same time, you can have very smart. So that's the kind of movements we allow in structure. We don't want large movements. Right? Okay, now, this is internally stable, uh, but you can take the whole thing and throw it like that. Right? You, I can say, can, you can. So, externally, can move. So, we don't want to okay, we have to that also. That we'll deal with later, but let's look at. The other option that he said, put a diagonal and it will also go into the hinge. This will also arrest the movement. Hmm? This is a fundamental thing that we, this concept we use in trusses. Triangulation helps. So you, you, you can prevent movements or if you want, you can add one more diagonal. If you add one more diagonal, uh, you are making it, you can do so. I know I won't let it. So here, if you drag around, little movement is possible. Here, free play is possible. Here, little movement is possible. Little movement. Here, you are making it stiffer, so even that movement is reduced. But in the process, something is happening to the structure. That structure is becoming statically indeterminate. You see, I want you to first see the the physics, the geometry of it, the displacement field. And then you can see that it is linked to the force field. So we'll come to stuff later. Let's be strong in geometry. Okay, you're getting it? So let's use work now. This is a mechanism. This is just rigid. This is just rigid. This is over rigid to one degree. And you can achieve over rigidity by saying, let's see, I, I, let's say I bring down the four joints. I mean, I have four rigid joints. It's enough if I had done only for one. 
So I have made it over rigid to a degree of 3. That incidentally is your degree of internal static indeterminacy, a box. Okay. So uh, I, I, in the book, something else I introduce is what's called just rigid, over rigid, this you could call under rigid. That does not have adequate constraints to make it stable. Basic concept. Now we will quickly look at external stability. Now, uh, look at our tree. Nature's examples are lovely examples. We have so many trees in the campus. A tree is supposedly fixed at the base. Now, this campus is full of monkeys. So, they apply a lot of forces in all directions that you can think of. So, the tree uh, cannot move vertically. So, the weight of the tree and the weight of the monkeys on the tree get an upward reaction because this movement is arrested. Got it? The tree cannot transmit horizontally in any direction, but you take two orthogonal that it can't move this way, it can't move that way, normally, unless you have a flood, then you know the soil is loose and then it can move, but I normally no. So it can take a horizontal reaction, the monkeys are people are pulling horizontally, this way and this way. Got it? So three translations arrested, three acts, three forces, three reactions. Fx, Fy, Fz are possible because we arrest delta x, delta y, delta z. Now we'll talk of rotations. This is like a vertical cantilever. So if I have a branch there and the monkey's weight is pulling it down, this will tend to move like that. But the slope here is going to be zero. We draw a tangent. So it's a vertical cantilever. So this moment is arrested. Similarly, this moment is arrested. Right? And finally, uh, let's say there's a heavy wind and it's, uh, you know, it's not symmetric and it's kind of swaying on one side. It will rotate. But this angle of twist is also arrested. So, if you want complete stability, you need six degrees of freedom to be arrested in a spatial structure. Is it clear? Six. You need more than six. We are making it over rigid externally. How much more? Well, now, uh, why does a table have four heads? Normal tables are four heads. What is the minimum number you need to make it stable? Three. Then why don't we give three legs? Because for some reason, in our minds, we, we someone imagined a table to be something rectangular. God knows why. If you give a circular table perfectly, you could manage with three. If you give three, it looks a little odd aesthetically. So we give four legs. Now you know you have to get those uh, steel tables and coins. You know that it actually works only on three. The fourth one, you don't have the floor, and you can play with it in the First thing you do when you go to the house, take some carpet and put it underneath one of the yes or no? I don't know many reasons. Sometimes the legs are perfectly all of the same height, but the floor is sagging because uh, st of structural behavior. And uh, you know, uh, near the wall, it's not going to move but closer to this, so you want to wedge that movement. I'm getting it, but it actually can stand just on three. Fourth is so we say it is redundant. The fourth leg is redundant. Another one for redundant is it is extra. It is super clear for the absolute minimum needed. But if you get the fourth, it gives you some additional uh, benefits, which we'll see. It makes it stiffer and more difficult to calculate. Uh, so that's the redundancy. That's a degree of static indeterminacy of one you've got. Are you getting it? So there's a whole minimum and there's something extra. If you have a planar structure, like a, a beam, you know, simply supported beam is perfectly uh, just rigid, you are resting three more. So six reduces to three. If I have a beam, that's a 
I am resting 3 degrees of freedom. One rotation, two translation, good enough. If I give it back to you, it's an extra. It's redundant. It's not required. Getting it? So that's how we arrive at external stability. And the standard picture we put, there's a dark line here showing it's a fixed support. We, because we have 3 degrees of freedom, we have 3 reactions possible. There is 2 degrees of freedom, 2 reactions possible. There is 1 degree of freedom, 1 reaction possible, but no reaction in this direction. You have, this is called a guided fixed support, okay, which we'll encounter later. Here we allow free movement. This is sometimes called a sticky roller. The reason is, uh, we imagine this roller to be sticking to the floor uh, because only if it sticks, it can take an upward reaction in our minds. We should understand, otherwise we do jump off. We don't want that. So here you are releasing this movement, so no vertical reaction, but you are resisting this translation and this rotation. So there is a moment and horizontal reaction possible. But if you want to generate in, uh, in structural engineering, uh, the, 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 the people who want one symbol to take care of possibilities, you put spring supports. They call elastic supports. So, uh, for example, for a planar system, if I give this, it covers all these cases. I just have to put values of either kx, this translation spring, to have values of 0 or infinity. If I put 0, that means it's not stiff at all. It's like a free end. If I put infinity, this movement is, trans is arrested. Similarly, I can have vertical spring and I can have a rotational spring, like in a door closer. Got it? So this, uh, and I could take values in between. So these are called elastic sub, uh, support reactions. Okay, fine. Some examples of, this is a refresher course. Okay, I'm not going through the whole thing. Just giving you a taste for you to, uh, to enjoy and to see how simple the whole subject is. Now, this, uh, we said here in the previous class that you need minimum three supports, but you have to provide them at the right places. Now here I've given a, a beam, it's a continuous beam, but I gave three roller supports. That won't be good, right? Why? Can it take loads? Yes, you, you're traveling in trains, no? How does the train sit at the platform? It's taking loads. But then you don't want to sit there all the time. You won't go to uh, wherever you want to go. You want it to roll. <laughs> right? So you want to move, but it must carry with. So equilibrium is possible even in a displaced configuration. I want you to get that. So if I apply a load here, yeah, I'll get some reactions here, and this one will be reversed. And this will be the likely deflected shape. But even without any loads, I can give it a rigid body motion. It's unstable. You, if you say it's something unstable, you must be able to visualize it and draw it in the displaced cone. And it is unstable because I can give large movements completely uh, equal to the size of the structure itself. And totally not acceptable for stability. Got it? Rigid body translation under horizontal pattern. I just have to blow it. If it's a frictionless surface, it will fly. If I give three reactions here, but they are all pointed in the same direction, so the lines of action of the reactions are concurrent, they meet at a point, then you are in trouble. First, can you draw the unstable position? You will find that unless for example, if I take moments about this point O, these reactions will not have any moment, but there will be an overturning moment P into this distance, which is um, not equilibrated. So it will rotate. The only time it will be temporarily stable, hmm, it is uh, critically stable, is when, though, so you know in, in equilibrium we have those three. Neutral equilibrium, unstable equilibrium, stable equilibrium. So this will be unstable equilibrium. If I put it here, 
But if I give a small perturbation, it's unstable. So if I give a reaction P here alone, it will work. Okay. But I must be able to draw the unstable position. So that I can draw. This is how it will move. Drawing needs right brain neurons firing. So you have other examples. The moral of the story is this. The support reactions should be so located and aligned such that their lines of action are neither mutually parallel nor convergent, nor concurrent, nor converge at a point. Is it clear? Simple basics. We'll move on. You can ask questions anytime. So let me begin with a favorite simple question I ask in interviews. If you, uh, so those I've asked this, keep quiet. Let it be a free for uh, all the others. I have a log of wood. You and your friend want to carry it. The log of wood has the same diameter, prismatic. Its weight is W. Both of you are carrying at the two ends. It has a length L, let us say. What is the weight carried by each of you? W by 2. Perfect. Now, a third friend sees you. Both of you are sweating it out. He says, relax, guys. I'll come to help. I know he's a pretty muscular guy. He says, I'll come and help you. And he holds it exactly in the middle. Now, what is the weight shared? One third, one third, one third. You are from structures, you tell me. Is it one third, one third, one third? BTCM. But you have come to my class? Yeah, okay, doesn't matter. This is a normal answer. Laymen give. But you are engineers. Aren't you engineers? You should not talk like this. Why is that answer not necessarily correct? Now think, you want, maybe you want to change. You, you imagine you're you imagine you're actually holding in the middle. Aren't you going to carry more weight than these two rascals at the two ends? They're cheating. They'll take the same money for carrying, but aren't you going to carry more weight in the middle? What do you feel? Agreed. So middle guy, how much is he now going to carry? Revise your answer. W by two. See. Total weight is W by 2. And so you two guys are carrying only W by 4, W by 4. Is that a correct answer? Is that correct answer? That answer is also not necessarily correct. So what is the correct answer? You figure it out. Okay. So I'll give you another problem. But that's how simple it is. You know, how foolishly we give wrong answers and how confidently we speak. So first of all, you have indeterminacy only because you've constrained the structure too much either internally or externally got it that's a cause the cause is kinematic you have arrested more than the minimum required and the effect is your equation of equilibrium are not enough to crack to give you the force response you need additional equations Okay, so we call these structures either hyperstatic or statically indeterminate. The structure is over constrained, over rigid, and that's why. This is normally not understood well, not taught typically in courses in structural analysis. So we have just rigid structures like this. You know, you've probably learned this formula m plus r equal to 2j. Never mug up formulas. How this formula came m plus r equal to 2j in a planar truss? The simplest truss you can think of is a triangle. That is internally just rigid, stable. It's got three members, m is equal to three. It's got three joints. So J stands for joints. J is also three. Now you bring in external supports. You want to make it just stable, simply supported. You are bringing in R equal to 3. Potential reactions are 3. Simple support, right? M3, R3, 
3 plus 3 is equal to 2 j 3 into 2 6. If you want to give one additional member uh, one additional joint then you must connect that joint to, to the existing truss with two additional members and if you work out the formula that is how you can prove m plus r is equal to 2 j got it for a simple truss. Now this satisfies that and it is stable no problem it is just rigid degree of static indeterminacy is 0. But if I take the same structure and shift this diagonal here though the number wise my count is ok this is actually unstable why is it unstable that portion is not triangulated right. So, what will happen locally that portion is unstable and you can show the instability by actually demonstrating it it will move more important when we say it is unstable it behave like a mechanism it cannot resist any load under these conditions. If I apply a load here if I apply a load here this load reaches the reactions through the structure the forces are transmitted across joints and reaches there here it cannot because we make an assumption that these members are so flexible that they can resist only actual forces they cannot resist any shear forces. So, if you cut a section here the only way it can resist this is through a shear force and a moment which is not possible in a actual member. So, it is unstable ok, but if I put two diagonals here it is kind of over rigid and the degree of over rigidity this was good enough, but I put two more is clearly two and you can use this formula to do it. I am not getting into those numbers I am just refreshing your memory cantilever is just rigid if I put an internal hinge then it is unstable because locally this this part is ok, but this part will will move propped cantilever this was good enough, but you added one more prop vertical support. So, the degree of static indeterminacy is 1 the reason is you made it over rigid to the degree 1 cause is over rigidity effect is static indeterminacy <coughs> are you getting it cause and effect. If you do this then this you are eliminating by introducing a hinge there which gives you an additional equilibrium equation because it says no bending moment can be transmitted across that joint and if there is no moment here then you are saying the bending moment on both sides is 0. So, you got an extra equation it is called an equation of condition. So, cause effect uh, if you do this instead of roller this strictly it is 2 if you fix this it is 3 this is a simply support portal frame remember in the last class we demonstrated that we had fun drawing those pictures this is just rigid this is also just rigid I made both hinge support not roller, but then the it would without this internal joint the degree of static indeterminacy would have been 1, but I made up for it by giving what is called a moment release an internal hinge makes sense. Now, if I take this frame and put an internal hinge there that is unstable or if I take this frame and two hinges it is unstable and I should be able to draw the instability this can move like this well this 90 degree can change this can roll and this can move like this it can move indefinitely this angle can change. So, you must be able to draw it or in your mind you should be able to play with it and that playing is very very important for a structural engineer. There have been structures which have been built in fact, some years ago we were consulted in Cyberabad they built uh, tree shaped space structures, but the first model they put up thing collapsed and they asked us. So, we said there is some instability you have not seen it because it is too complicated too many members. So, we gave them a simple trick can you cut a section through your structure somewhere and you find there is no <coughs> member intercepting it. There must be a member intercepting it in a truss 
at an angle then only it can resist so they could find that that was happening so what's the solution just insert a member there <laughs> they did it it worked so uh, for a space truss the formula is not m plus r equal to 2j it's m plus r equal to 3j and m plus r minus 3j uh, should be if it's equal to 0 it's just rigid if it's greater than 0 that's a degree of static indeterminacy if it's less there's some instability but in this case they got the numbers correct but the locations were not correct now so a box frame is internally over rigid though externally it is just rigid so if i cut a section here then i'm bringing freedom right but not otherwise all right so before we go back to that question of uh, three people holding a, a, a log of wood let's look at this structure it looks pretty complicated no if your right brain is not working this is a difficult structure to analyze it can be asked in your gate exam can you quickly tell me what the reaction what is this reaction anybody P2. Huh? this reaction is p2 mm. P2 this is p2 by 2 guaranteed can you prove it what is this reaction vertical reaction P1 plus P2 by 2. On now, intuitively you said something. Now, the, in the Supreme Court, they will ask you, prove it. Can you prove it? By the way, your answers are correct. Intuition is correct. What is the bending moment here? Or the fixed end moment? So, this you can solve. See, uh, how many reactions are unknown? Horizontal reaction is 0, that equation you can avoid. The vertical reaction, the bending moment, the fixed end moment here, and the vertical. So, three unknowns. Sigma Fy equal to 0 is one equation. Sigma moment about any point here is another equation. But the third equation you get here is the bending moment not about the at either the left of this or the right of this is zero. that's an additional equation but to sit and draw all those equations will take you a lot of time if only you could give me answer like this i'll be so happy so let's learn that trick that's what makes the subject so beautiful so how do we do that to do that we'll say this is a nice picture to look at but not easy to understand so let's separate out the two members we'll do that Sometimes separation is a good thing, provided you put it back together. You open, uh, <laughs> you open your car and pull out everything, then finally it's a mess, you won't be able to drive it, but you must be able to put it back, or a bicycle or whatever. So let's separate. By the way, uh, in your mind, you should draw the deflected shape. All right. So if you separate, uh, is this separation a good separation? No. Why? At B, something is missing. What should you put at B? This is a loading diagram. So you have to put some support here at B. What support will you put? What support will you, what picture? What, I showed you many symbols. Which symbol will you put? You will put a spring, a simple vertical spring, right? If you don't put the spring, then this is unstable. So put a spring, very true. Here, what should I put? Should I put a spring there? No. Why? This fellow is resting on this fellow. This can stand on its own. It's stable. This is a. This is sometimes we say this is the child, and this is the parent. The parent holds the child. The child doesn't hold the parent. So whatever reaction you get here, that comes as a load here. So you can call this a shear here at B and that and this now you look at this if these this bang in the middle of this anybody can tell you this load will be shared equally here and here got it and whatever you put here you have to put reverse here because when you join them no load should act at B and so what you put here should be the same thing you put here and you already got this value so your answers are correct 
this is indeed P2 by 2, congratulations. And this reaction here, anybody can get is P1 plus P2 by 2 and from this free body, you can get this moment. Got it? So simple. Sorry? I am a structural engineer. I put correct things. What is a spring? A spring is an elastic support. In other words, it follows a certain law. What is the law? If I apply a, fo it follows Hooke's law. If I apply a load P, it will move by delta. If I apply 2 P, it will move by 2 delta. Yes or no? And that stiffness in the spring is a constant. It is P by delta. It is a force per unit displacement. Now I am going to ask you. So, there is a spring here because had I applied a double the load here, this would have gone down double. Right? Now, a spring is the right thing to put there. Can you tell me how to get the stiffness of the spring? The spring you put, how will you get the stiffness of the spring? What is the spring? Can anyone tell me what is the spring? What is the spring? I can draw this separately and hold it and it stands on its own. It doesn't need any support. I made the child strong and independent. What is the spring here? Anyone? Any division? Especially structures. We have postdocs, doctorates. What is the spring? That in this structure, what is the spring? The spring is the other element AB. <laughs> I have replaced this whole element by the spring. See? If I ask you what is your name, your answer should come tuck like that. That spring is the rest of the structure. If I want to find the spring stiffness exactly at the same location, if I apply load up P, and later we will learn this will go down delta. What is the value of delta? In a cantilever, if you apply a load P, what will be the deflection? PLQ by 3. You know all this. So, what is K? The stiffness of the spring? Tell me what is it? P by delta is how much? P by PLQ by 3i. So, how will you write it? 3i by L cube C. Ah, now you learn something. Have I answered, not only answered your question, some tube lights have started flickering. How lovely the subject is. And how free you are now. My God, I had to solve so many equations and all that. I didn't even understand what was going on. I didn't even know what. This is child's play, man. So easy, so beautiful. Right? And now you can draw the deflected shape. And, okay, it's important, okay, nice to draw this. How will you construct this? How will you make that hinge? It's also called an articulation. Bridges are made like this. So you want to make sure that the joint that you provide here will be such that a force is transmitted from this member to this and not the reverse way. So, if I make a detail like this, I make a bracket, a nib like this, and due to gravity load, and I put here some uh, Teflon sheet or elastomeric bearing so that it can move horizontally, that will be itself be another spring. It is like putting rollers here. Then, if I put this load here clearly, this is going to sit on this and this, if you take this, this can take that load. It is like that load coming bang here at B. Are you able to think of this? That is how a practicing, you, a designer should think of how to do it in practice. But once you plastered everything, you won't see anything. You won't even know there is a hinge there. That is the beauty of, of uh, doing good construction. You don't even know this. You can't see the hinge. Are you getting it? So, here you have no, if I replace this with this picture, it would have been easier. But even better, if I had 
instead of giving you this problem, I had given it like this, child's play. All of you would have given me the answers just like that. But remember, in examinations, they'll never give it to you like this. They'll always give it to you like this, and then you'll be spending hours trying to solve it. If they give you like this, then this is easy to understand. So are you seeing that there's a left brain and right brain involved, and the subject is so beautiful, and that you can get it like that? Now, don't say always there'll be a child and parent. Sometimes there are two parents. Uh, then it gets a little, you have to think. Maybe if supposing this was also fixed, you can't make one parent a child, right? And adults always have problems when they, you know, children are easy to deal with, but not parents. All right. We go to now a more generic concept of, let's understand what we mean by the force field, displacement field. How do we do that? So let's take an easy example of a truss. A truss is easy compared to a beam or a frame. Why? Only actual forces. No, it looks complicated, but you can count the number of members here. There are 11 members. I've numbered them, one, two, three, four. So how many internal unknown forces are there? 11. And I use a symbol N for the internal force, and I can apply potentially a load in any direction, but that load will have two components, one in the x direction, one in the y direction. This is called a planar structure. All the loads are in the same plane, and I give it some numbers. I'll say, at this joint, if I apply any force here in this direction, say 10 kilonewton, F1 is equal to plus 10. If I apply 10 kilonewton in the opposite direction, I'll say F1 is minus 10 kilo. If I apply a vertical load, so these are the x and y directions. Uh, 20 kilonewton acting up, plus 20. If it's acting down, minus 20. Got it? So potentially, where all, how many loads I can apply? Well, I've got so many joints. How many joints are there? There are seven joints. So everywhere I can put, so I can get 14 potential forces, completely independent. They can take any value. And they are loads. I got 14. When we study matrix methods, there's a way of numbering them. Um, so all joint forces are captured by these 14 numbers, right? So I've got 14 possible, you could say, loads. Some of the loads could be reactions. Because I've drawn a free body of the truss. A reaction will also be now seen as a load. And so this is external. And uh, I put F subscript J. J can have any number from 1 to 14. But the internal force in any bar, say take the bar number 11. Uh, that bar number 11 will have, an, I'll assume tension positive. So I marked it like that. So I have 11 bar forces. That's all. That's my complete force field. If you give me all the answers to F1, F2, F3, F4, F11, and N1, N2, N3. So F goes to 14 and N goes to 11. That's all I don't need. There's no mystery left. Some of these will be given. They are known. Some are unknown. That's all. My job as an analyst is to get the unknowns. Actually, I need to get only what I'm interested in. But if I give you the whole answer, Today, I can write a computer program in MATLAB with one, one press of the button, I get the whole field. Now, some of these loads may not be acting. Then you assume the default value is 0. So initially, everything is 0. Now, to make it stable, I need to do something. Okay, But before that, let's leave it as unstable. Let's look at displacements. Just like every joint can have a force applied on it in the x and y direction. Every joint can move in the x and y direction. And we'll follow a consistent numbering system, which is easy to understand. It's like the unit vector. If I reserve 1, 2 for this movement, uh, this direction and this direction, like a unit vector, then I use the same numbers here, d1, d2. d1 is a movement here, d2 is a movement there. At this joint, d3, f3, d4, f4. Got it? Very interesting. So I've Got my numbering system matching beautifully. 
right? The force field should be such that it should satisfy equilibrium. The displacement field should be such that it should satisfy compatibility. What is the meaning of compatibility here? My displacement field will involve not only the joint movements, it will also involve the bar elongations or contractions. Are you getting it? The bars can change in length. Now, if this 11th bar moved here, then if you look carefully, 11th bar will have here D9, D10, this joint is moved here and this is moved D5, D6. If I know D9, D10 and D5, D6, then the change in length in this bar is also fixed. That is called compatibility. You know that. It's fixed. It can't change. It will have to be one number. Are you getting it? So I have bar deformations, actual deformations, and just like I assume tension positive here, I assume elongation is positive. So I have the complete displacement field is D1, D2, D3, all the way to D14, uh, and E1, E2, E3, all the way to E11. Are you getting it? That's all. Now you might say, no sir, I want to know how much the middle of this bar moved. I say, no problem. We are doing linear structural analysis. These are linear elements. So if this fellow moved here and this fellow moved there, you can linearly interpolate and say this fellow moved exactly in the middle. And you say, no, no, I want to know how much a point at one third this location moved. I can still do it. And why is that justified? Can you, anyone tell me? Why is this linear interpolation justified? It is justified because this elongation is linked to the axial strain. We are making one big assumption here. What's the assumption we are making? The axial strain is the same anywhere in between these two nodes. And that assumption is justified if the actual force here is the same anyway, I cut this member. Are you getting it? You have to ignore the self-weight of that member. That's very small. So we are making an assumption that each of these bars are like springs. There's only one unknown, the actual force. And that actual force will introduce a stress in divided by cross sectional area. That stress will induce a strain, which is that divided by the modulus of velocity. And that is a constant wherever I cut the section. And because the strain is assumed to be a constant, if you integrate it, it's a linear function of the location. So you study this much better in finite element analysis, but your, the, the answer is the strains are constant in these maps. So this is my complete force field. This is my complete displacement field and I've got everything. There's nothing unknown. Now let's talk of real structures. I want this to be stable. I can put supports anywhere I like, but in this example, let me uh, so the equilibrium must be satisfied by the force field and compatibility by the displacement field. Don't we have the, it's coming later, the supports? Somewhere I've got it, okay. Uh, so we'll come back here, the same structure. Okay, now I put supports. When I put supports, I'm making a strong statement. This is now stable. So some displacements are known. What are they? I'm saying this cannot move. So D12 and D13 are zero. I'm saying this can move horizontally, but it can't move vertically. So D14 is 0. I brought in three constraints. And because I brought in those three constraints, I'm going to get three reactions in general. Are you getting it? Now, there is something called kinematic indeterminacy, which you will need in when you do the stiffness method, part 5 in the book. So let's get a freedom, let's get a good understanding of that. 
in kinematic indeterminacy, I don't care for statics. I am not looking at forces at all. I am looking only at the displacement field. I want to know everything in the displacement field. Now, if you tell me that three displacements are going to be always zero, then I already know something. Then my unknowns are only the remaining displacement, which are only 11 displacements. Right? And there is no unknown for any point in between because I am assuming linear interpolation, which is justified. Right? When I make that argument, then these are the only unknowns needed to understand the complete displacement field. And that is called the degree of kinematic indeterminacy. If you want a definition. So, in this structure, very interesting. The static indeterminacy is zero because it is statically determinate. It is just rigid. But the kinematic indeterminacy is huge. It is 11. So, a definition would be this. The degree of kinematic indeterminacy may be defined as a total number of degrees of freedom, independent displacement coordinates at the various joints in a skeletal structure. Neat definition. We will explore this later, but it is not in, enough just to, to study static indeterminacy. You must also know what kinematic indeterminacy. Independent uh, is like this. Why I could have taken a node in the middle of this joint and say that I will treat these two also as unknowns. But that is foolish to do because if I know these two movements and these two, this is also known. So, the movement here is dependent on these movements. It is not independent. But I can always visualize a situation where these can get different arbitrary numbers and the structure will still be integral. You understand what I am saying? That is the minimum I need, absolute minimum. And I can give arbitrarily any. See, you can imagine. In my mind, I give arbitrarily values of d1 to d11. d1 is 2 mm, d2 is minus 3 mm. I'll give play with it. With that, once I give that information, the elongations are all fixed. This e1 bar will elongate or shorten. Are you getting it? Even more interesting. Very interesting. I can do the reverse. I will heat these bars, 11 bars, to different temperatures. So, they will all move and they will all adjust each other. All these 11 degrees of freedom will move independently, but they are a function of. So, you can work either from member to joint to structure or structure to member. We will see that later. In fact, that is a very interesting question to ask. If a structure is statically indeterminate, you are running short of equations of equilibrium, which you must get from compatibility. Right? That is where you need. But why do not we need to look at deformations in statically determinate structures? Why? Is it that somehow compatibility is satisfied when you satisfy equilibrium? It is. And very few people know the proof for that, the powerful proof in just rigid structures, in statically determined structures. When you are satisfying equilibrium, you are simultaneously, without your knowledge, also satisfying compatibility. We will prove it okay, using our principle of virtual work. Okay. Now, to complete this, so this is a beam element, <coughs> no actual deformation. So, this has two degrees of freedom here. 2 degrees of freedom here. This can go up or down. When I put one arrow, it also includes the opposite direction. right? This is positive sign. And I am giving the physical meaning of this. This beam can take a deflected shape like this. So, D1 would mean this translation, vertical deflection. D3 would mean this deflection. D2 would mean this anti-clockwise rotation of a tangent drawn here. And D4 would mean this. Now, these four degrees of freedom are sufficient for me to capture the complete displacement field. Now, I am really interested in say the midpoint of this. The midpoint of this, I want to know how much this has deflected and this has rotated. Right? So, here is that a correct description? purely from a geometry point of view. 
if I know d1, d2, d3, d4, can I not interpolate and get the deflection at any location in this, any location x out of L? How do I do it? How do I do it? Use your common sense. How do I do it? You have to interpolate, but you've got, it's not two, you've got now four data points. How do you interpolate? all degrees of freedom. So, how will you do it? Simple mathematical way of doing it. You can write an expression for deflection here at any d of x as a function of d1, d2, d3. How will you write it? What equation do you have in mind? Well, you will write a polynomial function normally, right? What is the order of the polynomial? Huh? It will be fourth order or third order? It will be third order, you will write it as d is equal to a x cubed plus b x squared plus c x plus d. I mean some constant, right? You have got four boundary conditions. At x equals 0, you know how much is the deflection, you can take the slope and write. At x equal to l, you know that. So, you can plug it in and people have done that and you end up with a cubic Hermitian polynomial that in finite element analysis that is your shape function and it seems to be it works out to be the exact shape function. Why? Because there is I did not talk about till now there is something called a force displacement relationship. What is how will you relate the displacements in a beam to the forces in the beam to the bending moments in the beams? I want you to think over it, okay? Uh, why should I give you all the answers? You guys have to work and you will find that when you work through statics, you will end up with a cubic function. So, you will get it magically, but here we are just stopping here. So, you have a fixed beam. If you are interested only at the two ends, a fixed beam is kinematically determinate because all the degrees of freedom are arrested at the joints, but at the same time it is statically indeterminate. Very interesting. Cantlieber, this can move up and down. So, this has got a kinematic indeterminacy of 2, this has got an indeterminacy of 4. A plane frame element is different from a beam element. Now, you are allowing movements and actual movements at A and B, right? Right? So, you have got 6 degrees of freedom. If you take a portal frame with fixed base here, this can't move, this can't move. 3 degrees of freedom here, 3 degrees of freedom, 6 degrees of freedom. But we generally do not take so many degrees of freedom. We make a simplification. What is the simplification we make? We say actual deformations are negligible. It is a valid assumption to make normally. And so, how much will this reduce to? This will reduce to 3. This rotation is there. This rotation is there. These two translations are there. But if you say actually this can't change its length, then these two in the horizontal direction will be the same. So, you do not, now you understand they are not linearly independent, they are linearly completely dependent and fully correlated. And this translation degree of freedom we call the sway degree of freedom. So, see this looks much more simple compared to this. Agree? What about this? A box frame. A box frame you will find this can rotate, this can rotate, this can rotate, this can rotate, but the left and the right will move by one sway degree of freedom, right? This, you should not put a degree of freedom here because if this can't change in length, then this is, this can't move horizontally and that is an assumption you are making. Okay. Uh, these are basics of indeterminacy. I will end with one last slide to compare the two. Okay, so this is a typical multi-story frame. Simple question. Tell me the degree of static indeterminacy of this frame and the degree of kinematic indeterminacy. Kinematic indeterminacy A, not assuming actual deformations are negligible, B, simplifying, assuming actual deformation. So, static indeterminacy, what is the degree of static indeterminacy? Huh? 36. Nine. Wide variation 9 and 36. Anything in between or more? 36. 36. 
How do you get that? 39? How did you arrive that? Tell me the formula. For every box, okay, that's because we saw for every box there is an unknown of 3. Remember the welding of the joints? 3. How many boxes you have? 9. This box you are not counting? Okay, he doesn't want to count this box. So, you have got 9 boxes. So, 9 into 3, 27. Then? Reactions. So, how many reactions you need for just rigid externally? 3. How many you have got? 1, 2, so these are extra, 9 are extra, so 27 plus 9, 36, that's one way of doing it. Any other way, anybody? I'll give you a lovely way, yeah. Ah, good, good student, you attended my class structure. So, one, see, your, go to nature. The tree is a beautiful example of a statically determinate structure. Nature is very economical, it doesn't just give you redundant supports exceptions being banyan trees and you know but normal trees just stand like that right can't leave her. so all you do is to make this into trees how do you make it into tree mentally take some scissors and cut 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 then you've got four trees are the trees okay trees are statically determinate so wherever you put a cut you've got some internal forces how many Internal force is at every cut. It's a plane frame element. Three, an axial force, a shear force, and a bending moment. So, as many cuts you have, that you multiply by three, you will get. So, that's all you have to do. You've got four stories, you've got three bays, 12, and you've got in every one you're cutting, so you've got 36. Clever way of doing it. Okay, but both ways are okay. You can do. Now we'll come to kinematic indeterminacy and we'll close for today. What's the degree of kinematic indeterminacy? Huh? 20. How did you arrive at 20? No, no, consider actual deformation first. We will do the exact method, then we'll do the simplified method. At every joint, how many degrees of freedom? 3. So how many joints you have? Simple calculation. How many joints you have? 16 into 3, 48. So your decision whether to do the force method of analysis or displacement method of analysis, if you are doing it manually, will usually be governed by which is easier to do. Here you have to solve 36 simultaneous equations. Here you have to solve 48. The more you have to solve, the more difficult it becomes. But we can make it easier. The actual deformation are negligible. This 48 will reduce to the rotation will remain. So at every joint you have an unknown rotation. So how many rotations you have? As many joints as you have. So you have 16 rotations plus 4 sways. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So 48 becomes 20 and 20 is more economical than 36. Alright, so we'll end with this today. And I'm giving you as a homework that problem that I asked. You've done it, you come and sh show in the next class.